Hi everyone, how you doing? This is Larry Port with Rocket Matter. I am very excited to be presenting in conjunction with the Florida Bar, a 12 month plan for going paperless. I like this subject, right? Paperless is a very uh, important subject to a lot of the attorneys that we work with. And a lot of times we just don't know how to get started with it or how to take action. So the goal of this webinar today is to get you in the place where you can do things, right? Where you can actually take actions and make a difference in your firm. And it's going to be gradual. You're not gonna be overwhelmed at once. Before I get started, let's get a show of hands. Can I find out from you if you can hear me and see me and see my screen? I don't know if you can see me, if you can see my video or not. That's not something I can see. But can you see my screen? Can you hear my voice? Use your questions widget in the GoToWebinar control panel and okay good all right so wonderful this is my office um there's palm trees in the background we're in you know beautiful uh this is a florida bar webinar so i guess that's not um so astounding to people um a lot of times when i work with people in alaska they get quite tickled by that so um in any case let's get started right away and i want this to be interactive this is live it is currently 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, April 25th. So um, this is live right now. For the people in the future, obviously it's not live, but this is live right now. Ask me questions, I can um, answer them. So the more interactive this is, the better it is. Write me your concerns. What are you having trouble with? Where have you been stumped going paperless? And I'll see what I can do to kind of unstick people. So let's get started right away. Okay, this is me, I'm Larry Port. I'm the CEO of Rocket Matter. I actually started the company. I'm a coder. I coded the first version of Rocket Matter back in 2007. And I loved coding. You put your headphones on, you listen to Pink Floyd, you escape into this like crazy world where you're just coding. And then people started buying it and here I am. Now I'm running the company, which is fun too. I like that. Um, I, I love to write, I love to read, I coach Little League, um, I'm active in the Anti-Defamation League, I'm always trying to stay healthy and eat right and exercise, and that's my whole deal, and I got a wife and kids and uh, two dogs and a cat. Um, this is the book I wrote for the American Bar Association, so there's this whole concept of lean that's in other industries, it's in healthcare, it's in government, it's in software, it's in manufacturing, and the whole idea is how do you model your knowledge business based off of factory concepts. Lean comes from the Toyota production system. And the whole idea is that um, you want to provide value to your customer, or in your case, your client, and you want to eliminate waste. And waste is anything that doesn't provide value to your client. And then we wrote a whole book about that concept. And so that's at leanlawfirmbook.com. We have a podcast and everything. So What's interesting about lean is that if you're not running a paperless office, and this is something that we say in the book, then you're neck deep in waste, or as it's referred to in lean, which is a Japanese system, muda, right? So going paperless kind of fits into a bigger context of running a more efficient firm and providing more value to your client, right? So that is um, the context that we're gonna be talking about. now. You're on this webinar for a reason. So you probably don't need to see all these things, right? Um, but you're probably already convinced that paperless is the way to go. But if you weren't convinced, going paperless allows you to increase efficiency. So you're gonna waste less time hunting around for files. You're gonna be, you're gonna be able to access them from wherever. You're not gonna be dependent on a physical location. You can access them from whatever computer you're on. If it's cloud-based, you'll be able to access it from your aunt's house on Thanksgiving. Um, the level of backups that you get with going paperless is, is, is paramount. In fact, the first attorneys that I spoke with that were very serious about going paperless were the ones from New Orleans that had survived Katrina because they had seen like total devastation there and they lost a lot of files. So, uh, if they're looking at paperless as a ways to prevent, uh, disaster and losing stuff, then it's a good model to follow. Um, no more lost files, um, and you know there is an expense to storing paper paper files, whether or not you have to have real estate for it in your office, or if you have to like, you know, have storage or whatever it is. So um, there's a lot of different reasons for going paperless. Now, um, <clears throat> how do we do it? 
how do we do it? So we're going to take a month by month approach. And this is a 50 minute webinar. So we can pretty much spend approximately five minutes per month. Some months are going to be a little bit harder or easier. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. The first thing you got to do is you got to say, okay, in 12 months, I am going to be paperless. I am going to throw down the gauntlet, plant my flag on the ground, whatever you want to call it. I am making a commitment to myself that finally, this is the year I'm doing this. And I know that it's not going to happen now. I know that it's not going to happen next month. It's not all going to happen, but we're going to start chipping away at it. All right. We're going to realize that there are going to be setbacks along the way. Um, and we are going to power through those setbacks and we're going to keep our eyes on the prize. And in 12 months, we're going to kind of finally be where we've always wanted to be. And the year flies by. I mean, it, it, you know, a year is kind of like one day at a time. It's kind of slow, but as they say, I don't know what the expression is, something like the days, the hours, whatever, the weeks fly by, the hours don't, I don't know. But my point is this, is that before you know it, you'll be there. Um, a major problem that we see, I have a weird vantage point. Okay, so, you know, Rocket Matter, we serve thousands and thousands of attorneys, right? So we get to see how all these different law firms operate. And one of the things that we observe is that some of the biggest barriers to change are your employees. So we've had law firms invest a lot of money into Rocket Matter, um, you know, sign contracts with us, you know, pay all this money for converting data. And then because of somebody in the back office or in the office administration, the entire project derails, right? Some people are resistant to change. And what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to identify those people or get their buy-in or remove them. Because if you don't get their buy-in and they're still there, um, your project is going to fail. You need the buy-in of your staff. If your staff is not along with you for this journey, you need to know that. And if and you owe it to yourself to run an efficient office. And I know that this happens a lot when law firms try and move in a positive direction to improve their profitability, to improve their efficiency, but a, a legacy kind of employee is, is in their way and you have to be fair to yourself. So this is what it's going to take in order to get you there. Make a commitment and get the whole team on board. All right, let me see if there's any questions right now. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna come back to this. Safety and cloud storage and access if the internet is down. For example, Florida bad weather. Um, and what suggestions um, do I have for those things? So thank you, Phil, for those questions. I will definitely um, answer those during this. Somebody asked, Joseph asked, can I get a copy of the slides? Everybody's gonna get a copy of the slides. Everybody's gonna get a copy of the recording if you wanna share it at a later time. All right, month two, determine your process. All right, so look, I know everybody wants to stampede into the cool technology part of this and all the fun stuff involved in going paperless, but we can't do that yet. What we have to first do is make sure that we have a very standardized process so we don't screw up our documents and lose them, right? We need to be able to do the same thing every time and we need to know how this flow is gonna happen in our office before we even start with the technology piece, okay? Specifically, what are you going to, how are you going to handle internally created documents? What is going to be your paperless workflow for internally created documents? You know, whatever hearing notices you have to send out, you know, whatever pleadings you're going to generate, what, whatever it is, your, your engagement letters, whatever documents you create internally, what's that flow going to be like? How is that, how is that going to happen? How will you handle externally created documents? You get something in from the courthouse, you get something in from opposing counsel, how is that going to be made paperless? And then what are you going to do with the originals? So, um, you know, how are you going to avoid copies of things being all over the place? So you got to be able to answer these questions. Now, way back in 
a ways back, not that far back, but maybe late last year, I had the pleasure of doing a webinar with Brian Sims, who is a Rocket Matter user. He's also out in Illinois in the Chicagoland area, and he is a wizard when it comes to paperless. And he speaks at ABA Tech Show and you know around the Midwest about the issues involving paperless. And, and we did a webinar with him. And he lives it, he breathes it, and he evangelizes about it because he's so passionate about this stuff. So um, in a few slides, I'm going to show you a link where you can see that more internally. But he does a great job breaking down processes and how things are going to be. And so here's a little overview of um, how Brian models things. So first of all, you have your internal documents that you got to create, right? Pleadings, motions, briefs, letters, memos, faxes. All right. Now, the internal document workflow. Um, <clears throat> Most of the time, you're going to create documents in Word. So you may be able to create, we have document automation in our software, and there's other tools that do document creation, like hot docs and things like that. But let's say you're working in Word. Uh, you don't need a scanner, right? Um, that's why there's a little like X in front of this thing, because you do not need to scan or print in this situation. All right. So you're, you create the document. You need to have the ability to add signatures. So you have to have a digital copy of your signature. Usually what you do is you write your signature with a Sharpie or something like that, you scan it in. Uh, there's other ways with uh, other tools where you like do it graphically with your trackpad on your Mac or whatever you wanna do, okay? And that you have a folder called word processing documents in your file structure somehow, okay? So let me actually use the bouncing ball so you can like see specifically what I'm talking about. I don't know if that's working. Let's see if this is working. No, I'm trying to highlight um, different things. There we go. Okay. So, so then you want to have, uh, you want to be working for the most part with PDFs. PDFs are great. They're distributable documents. We all know what a PDF is, but they can't really be changed that easily. And um, so, but you're, you're going to be sending out PDFs, right? So you're going to keep your originals that you're working on in this word processing docs folder here, right? And the PDFs can be filed in the appropriate place. Let's say that this was some sort of pleading. We'll put it here. Okay, that's where the PDF goes. And then it can be emailed or it can be filed with, uh, with the court system. So that's how that works. Uh, that is an example of an internal document workflow. Again, you'll have a copy of the slides so that you can do it. And, and by the way, when you come up with these processes and these workflows, everybody's gotta do it every single time. So what I would suggest you do is you, you transfer this document that we have here um, into a series of checklist steps so that people can't get it wrong. Oops, pardon me one second while I advance the slide. Okay. The other thing is that you might have to print stuff here. Um, if, if this is something that doesn't, I guess is the point, is that if you don't email something out, you may have to send it out through the mail or, or actually drop it off at the courthouse itself. Um, by the way, um, a lot of times you can save time. It seems counterintuitive, but you can save time by actually filing things in person at the courthouse. Because if you um, send something by mail to the courthouse and wait for the response, um, a lot of times you're losing days on that, if not like weeks on that, when you could have had the thing filed. Um, and that it decreases your cycle time on a case, which ultimately the result of that is that you end up having a more profitable firm, which is something that we discuss in Lean, a little bit off topic right now, but something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, how do we handle external documents when they come in? You need a process flow for that. Okay, let's say that you have a mailbox. Uh, something comes in. Your receptionist takes it, the attorney reviews it, um, you mark it as reviewed, it goes back to the receptionist that scans it in into a PDF, um, and then OCR software, which stands for like um, optical character recognition, which takes a visual document and extracts text from it, um, and then you have a filing system for it. Again, you have this like folder structure that you set up and it goes in there. So again, inbound mail, receptionist, the attorney reviews it, marks it as reviews, the receptionist or support staff or however you wanna set this up, scans it in, 
and pay attention to that particular scanner because we're going to be coming back to that one becomes a pdf gets character recognized and then filed away so what about the originals all right so some stuff you know we're not going to destroy ancient documents we're not going to destroy wills right some of the stuff are are things that we got to keep around right and if you want more information specifically on this flow on this workflow for setting up a paperless office which again we're going to do in our second month um, go to bit.ly forward slash rm dash paperless dash webinar so that will get you a video recording of the presentation that i did with brian and you can go into heavy detail about that i'm going to stop real quick to see if there's any specific questions um, <clears throat> Okay. Somebody says here, my stumbling point is it is still quicker for me to grab a notebook from my shelf with frequently used documents than it is to access them on the computer. What do you recommend? Well, I guess the question is, um, you know, how many of those documents are we talking about? There are certain things that I keep with me in paper fashion. Like I'm not, when we're talking about paperless, it doesn't mean we're a thousand percent paperless or hundred percent paperless. What it means is that the vast majority of the work that we're doing is paperless. I oftentimes use paper, uh, paper stuff. For example, I mean, I have a whole thing right here. This is a mission plan. A lot of times I write these out by hand. This is how I delegate stuff to my staff. Um, let me show you this. I happen to have, um, and maybe some of you have seen this, but this is our, um, this is my daily planner. I fill this out with paper every single day, right? So I'm always writing down like what my best activities are and what my calendar events are. And I, I like to use paper. So even though Rocket Matter is completely paperless and we don't have a file cabinet at all, um, there are certain times and places where you're going to use paperless. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of questions coming in right now about specific pieces of technology that we'll answer as we go through. One, another question is, how do you create the digital signature? There's a lot of different ways to create a digital signature. One way to create a dig digital signature is you just get a Sharpie and a white piece of paper and you just create it like this and you use an application to take a picture of it. And now you have a now you have a file that you can use inside of Word or so on and so forth. If you're using uh, applications like DocuSign or HelloSign or one of those, and, and if you're not familiar with those, don't panic. Um, there are specific ways to handle digital signatures inside of those that are a lot easier to do than scanning it in and adding it to the document. Um, I will try to get to all of this stuff, um, all of the questions. And yes, you will have access to the slides. Everybody's all nervous. So month three, it's 2.19 p.m. And we're in month three, so I think we're in doing good. Okay, still not with the technology yet. Remember, so this is planning. We're planning, okay? When they make a movie, there's pre-production, and then you know there's the production aspect of it. So like when they're making Game of Thrones, most of the time is like not on set with like Jon Snow and Sansa. Most of the time is like planning it out, what they're gonna do, and this is what you're gonna do. I didn't know how I was going to get Game of Thrones into this uh, webinar, but I think I have succeeded in doing so. Now, we're going to um, establish in naming and filing conventions, right? So what is your overall folder structure going to be? Remember, we cannot lose documents. We're attorneys. So, well, you're attorneys. I'm a software engineer and I run a company, but you do not want to lose files. So what are your file naming conventions going to be? What are the folder structures going to be? How and how is this all going to work? You can combine this. This is really process oriented. So you kind of could combine this in your month to works. Remember, we're taking baby steps towards this stuff. And um, you need to get buy-in from your team. Remember, you always got to get buy-in from your team. If you're not getting buy-in from your team, why are you not getting buy-in? Are they stubborn and resistant to change? Are they going to derail this whole thing? If they're going to derail this whole thing, they need to, get a, they need to either get on board or they got to get out. So or else you will not succeed. One, if, if they're not getting on board, one of two things will happen. You'll keep them around and your process will derail or you'll get rid of them and you can succeed with your process. So you're gonna have tough decisions to make if you get resistance. Now, storage and filing are two separate things, right? Like the amount of storage and uh, that you need 
um, and the disk space that you need is storage. The, the filing and how you're going to set things up is separate. Now, this is a tool that Brian uses. It's called File Center Professional. And what it does is it allows you to create a default folder setup so that you don't have to go and do 01 pleadings, 02 word processing docs, correspondence discovery, so on and so forth. Every single time you set up a case, uh, it just you press a button and it just creates this thing for you. Um, so there's automated ways of creating these things. Now, keep in mind, Brian is a whiz with tech and um, not all of us are at this level. And, and when you're first starting out, you don't have to be. I'm a big fan of manual things before you automate things. Uh, so uh, a lot of times I start with index cards before I come, I go to like a computerized version of things. And this is the same way. Like um, make sure that you're comfortable creating document folder hierarchies in a specific way before you do it again. And you don't even have to do that really. You can create a template one that you just cut, copy and paste as long as you don't have the documents inside of it. You could have like a blank folder structure that you just copy and paste is another way to take care of this. So in any case, um, you want to you know how you're going to structure your folders. The next thing is about file naming conventions. How are They should be named the same way every single time. Is it, are you going to abbreviate letter into letter? And I would, I would recommend that you do. It's just easier to see. You know what LTR means, right? Memorandum or memo. But everybody's got to do it the exact same way. Dates. I am a huge fan of prepending every file name with a date in a very specific format. And it's the first one you see where it says 2018-01-21. And the reason I like that is because if you put that date into the file name, then you'll always know when the file was created. And because if you, a lot of times operating systems or file systems have a, the default view is when the file was last modified. But if you put the date at the beginning of the file name, then you can sort them in alphabetical order and you can see them. And if you, if you put the year first, then they'll definitely be in alphabetical order. If you put the month or the date first, then they won't necessarily be in the right order because um, you'll have all of the Januarys together across. If you, if you put the month first, for example, when you sort by name, you'll have all the Januarys across years. And if you have all of the days first, uh, then you'll have all of the days across months across years. So if you, by starting with year, then month, then date, they'll all sort the right way. So that's something there that I would take a look at. Um, we have probably, what's weird is that we published this blog post in 2016 on legal productivity, our blog, paperless law office, file structure and file naming conventions. And it is probably our top blog post. Like every time we look at our website traffic, like this is the one that people come and check out. Uh, so we have a whole, uh, article devoted to this and you can find it at bit.ly forward slash RM dash file dash naming. And again, Everybody's going to get a copy of these slides, so everybody will be able to see this. All right, we're going to hit our first piece of technology. So let's see where we are. Um, oh, somebody pointed out that, uh, Ashley, thank you very much. Adding a dot versus a dash keeps it in chronological order. Um, so that's a good piece of information. Somebody has a scanning question. Creating PDFs from Word, we might have a 100-page document and it's only a few kilobytes in size. But if we scan documents received in the US mail, we might have a page or two requiring several megabytes in storage space. This translates to huge backup costs. Suggestions. OK. Um, it is true. That like so so when you create a PDF from a Word document, what's happening behind the scenes is that it's not creating an image. It's just creating a document that has some code in it that has the actual text in the document. When so so it, it tends to be smaller. That's why the PDF is smaller when it originates from Word. When you scan in a document, it becomes an image, and that's why it's much bigger in terms of storage size. So because of that, you can scan at different resolutions and um, depending on the purposes that you need, you can reduce the file size. So there's ways to reduce the file size of a scanned PDF um, so that your storage costs are not so burdensome. And 
I would be curious why your storage costs are so burdensome because storage is like one of the most commoditized aspects of all of computers these days. So for example, we don't even charge for storage. Like when you store documents on Rocket Matter, it's unlimited storage uh, because it's, it's, it's really pennies on the dollars to store. So, um, you know, where you get into trouble in terms of storage space is like video, video depositions and things like that. But scanning in documents shouldn't be too onerous in terms of um, of storage size. If you have additional questions about me, about that particular thing, please email me, Larry at rocketmatter.com. Okay, let's talk about desktop scanners. So the, the big idea here is you should get desktop scanners for all your employees. Um, and don't get the multifunctional devices, the ones that also print. Um, and if you don't have it, uh, invest in PDF creation software. Now let's go into this, okay, because I just breezed through this. Now, here are the kind of big scanner choices facing you. You have the big office scanner, which is represented on the upper right-hand corner. You have the desktop scanner, that's a dedicated scanner on the upper left-hand corner, and then you have the multifunction device on the bottom. Now, here are my feelings about this. And these are not just my feelings about this. This is kind of corroborated by the guys that I, and, and, and the women that I look to in legal technology. If you have a common area big scanner, it, it, it acts as a, the opposite of an incentive. It de-incentivizes people to scan. They have to get up from their desk, they have to go over there, there might be a line, whatever. Um, if you have something on your desk, then you can use it whenever you want. There's never a backlog from it. You don't even have to move, right? Um, and Jim Calloway, who is a practice management advisor, and there's only 40 of them in the country, he works for the Oklahoma Bar Association. He says, look, everybody has their own wastebasket. Why don't they have their own scanner? So it's kind of true. It, it's one of those things that you should just kind of have on everyone's desk, um, in my opinion. They're not that expensive in the grand scheme of things. Uh, the bottom thing, the multifunction scanner, the reason that I'm not a fan of that is because I believe with this kind of thing is that you are a document professional. Uh, you are a law firm. So you want the best of breed product and the best of breed product is a dedicated device. They tend to break less because they only have to do one thing as opposed to four different things that could possibly break. Um, the, on a multifunction device, no particular function works that well. On a scan snap, the Fujitsu scan snap, everything works amazingly well. I think it can process something like 25 pages per minute. It does both sides, duplex as they say. Um, it de-skews, so if the document is pulled in a little bit at an angle, it unangles it and lines everything up. It's just brutally amazing. And it comes, it has the ability to connect to Wi-Fi, and they have this thing called ScanSlap Cloud, which we actually integrated with. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to press that blue button on there, scan a document, and it's automatically imported into a program of your choice, whether it's Rocket Matter or whether it's, I think, Dropbox is one of them too, or Expensify. So they have a handful of things that allow you just to press the button, it ends up in your cloud software. You don't have to do the Wi-Fi scanning. You can connect the scanner directly uh, to your computer using USB or whatever, you know? So, um, but this is best of breed. The Fujitsu ScanSnap iX500, um, that is the one you wanna be looking for. So there's other out there, there's other dedicated scan, scanners out there. I think Epson has one, I think Neat has one, but this is the one that we use and advise our attorneys to use. And that kind of comes from the legal technology community that I look to for this kind of information. Um, PDF software options, the big boy in the room to create PDF documents, Adobe PDF. I'm not as advanced of a PDF user as some of my friends in the legal community are. They understand how to do the bait stamping and all that other kind of stuff. A lot of these programs do the same type of thing. Um, these are some of the options, Foxit, Power PDF by Nuance, uh, Nitro. Um, I, for my purposes, and I don't have heavy duty PDF needs, I use a Mac and I rely on Preview. Preview allows for me to type onto a PDF. It allows me to add my signature to a PDF. Um, and it's, it allows me to reduce the size of them. It's, it's really powerful software for something that's built right into a Mac. So these are some of the software options that you have available to you. 
So I know somebody was asking questions about PDF uh, software. I hope that answered your question. And um, if not, email me Larry at rocketmatter.com and I'll try and go a little deeper. I do answer your questions. So choose an online file storage provider. Okay, now this is like, we're pretty far along, right? If you think about our journey so far. So the first thing we did was we made a commitment in month one. The second thing we did in month two was we designed a process. The third month we designed a file structure and a file naming convention thing and got everybody to agree on it. And we're now we're starting to see if we're having holdouts into the process. Month four, we have a scanner. Now we need to choose where the file storage is gonna go. Um, at this point, we're pretty close. So I'm a big fan of file storage providers that uh, automatically sync with your desktop. Um, and smaller law firms, we work with a lot of smaller law firms at Rocket Matter, um, and they tend to use things like Dropbox or Box, maybe Google Drive. Now, larger organizations, and we work with a number of those too, they like Net Documents, they like Box, and they like Google Drive, right? They tend not to use Dropbox so much. Um, also, I should probably do a shout out for, you know, some of the other products on the smaller end of the mar market. I mean, there's Dropbox, there's, um, I guess there's iCloud as well. Um, I'm not a fan of iCloud. I just don't like it so much. I do like Dropbox. I do like Box. I do like um, Google Drive. And Net Documents does is a lot of firepower for the firms that need it. Um, <clears throat> so, document storage. And somebody's asking, what about offsite storage? Um, like Carbonite. Okay, well, I'll talk about those too, because those are those those fill a different need. That's a backup solution. Now, um, document storage. So, Google Drive, Box, OneDrive is the one that I forgot. iCloud, um, and we have unlimited storage too in Rocket Matter. Um, you know, and so that's useful. It's not a synchronized thing that goes with your desktop. But the nice thing about these other products, uh, like Google Drive, Box, OneDrive, and Dropbox, is that they mirror your file system on your computer. So, you know, you go into the cloud and you have access to your files and they're also on your desktop as well. Um, so those are very, very handy things to do and to have. Um, we integrate with most of these things. So, um, you know, even if you're not using our own document storage, um, you can access your files. So the other one is Evernote too. It's kind of a note-taking application, but it could be used for document storage. Evernote's kind of its own kind of beast. Now, somebody was asking what about things like Carbonite, and another market leader is Mosey. Um, and there's another one called Crash Plan too. So what these things do, these are like automated backup systems. So th that would be like another lock on the door. Like when, when you're using a system like this, like Box or OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive is what I mean by that, like an active file system that you can access. When you're using a system like that, you're already backing up into the cloud into an offsite location. But if you want an extra lock on the door, you could sign up for a service like Mosey or Carbonite or something like that, which basically just once a night takes all your stuff, zips it up and uploads it somewhere in an encrypted fashion. And so that way you have like another layer of backups going on. And those services are called Moseying and Carbonite. Incidentally, back in the day when I was starting up Rocket Matter, there was a lot of debate about whether or not it was safe to store your data in the cloud. Um, back in like 2011 or sometime in that time frame, the ethics opinions came down saying, yes, you, it's okay as long as you do your due diligence on the software provider. But prior to that, the only thing we really had to go on was um, the decisions about online backup storage. And so even when we launched in 2007, 2008, there was already opinions out saying that it was okay to use encrypted backup online storage providers. So um, I would not be concerned about using them. Okay, let's see, how are we doing so far? Okay, there are a lot of questions. Um, all right, let's keep going. Uh, uh, let me know if there's anything else on any of the issues that I just said. If anybody has other scanners that they wanna give a shout out for or would like to challenge anything I said, I'm happy to entertain those. Month number six, automate your billing and collections. Okay, so one of the things that we excel at and one of the things that we see commonly in the marketplace is that law firms extend out their 
receivables unnecessarily. Um, so the typical thing is that a law firm will, if they're if they got their stuff together, they're billing on the first of the month. A lot of law firms don't even have that going on yet. But you know, if you want to make sure that you have um, a regimented process for collecting as much as possible, everything has to be very standardized. So um, what we see is a process where the law firm will generate their invoices one way or another. And a lot of times it can take like a full day to generate invoices. They print them out. Uh, this is, a, forget the pre-bill process and all that. Um, but let's say that they have the invoices ready to go. They print them out, they fold them all, they put them in envelopes, they address them, they stamp them, and they send them. Then they got to wait 30 or 60 days and receive payment in the mail. Usually it's in a check form. And so when they, they, they have to open the checks, they have to um, associate the check with the matter or the client, and they have to enter the stuff and, and reconcile everything. So um, that's typically the way the process works, and it's typically like a 30 to 60, 90 day cycle. So what we're able to do is we're able to kind of reduce that down to like a, in, in some cases, same day, uh, even when they get the money in. Um, it's, it's not unheard of. Um, so let me kind of just give you a sense of how that works. So if you can see my screen, let's go to the Rocket Matter dashboard for a second. What I'm going to do is I am going to create a matter. I'm going to make me the client, and I'm going to call this uh, blue versus orange, knowing that I may upset some Florida State fans. Okay, so I just created the matter. Um, matter is now created. I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit the matter. I'm going to change one or two things on it. All right. So I'm going to say there's a flat fee on this matter for $2,500. Okay. And then I'm going to specify an email address for billing. So I'm going to share invoices over uh, to me. And I am going to, I made uh, an email address for us to use called 12 months paperless at mailinator.com and I'm gonna choose that one. Okay, and now I have my flat fee. I could have added billable time, but I didn't wanna do that just in the interest of, of stuff. So, so let's say that I'm ready to invoice this matter. I'm on this billing screen, uh, billing screen and, and I'm ready to go. So I'm gonna click invoice and I want it to be a PDF. I want it to be an invoice and I'm gonna click next. Confirm, yes, I'm serious. I really want to invoice this client. Go. All right, so now what it's doing is it's processing the invoice. It's creaming everything. It's sending it out. And if we take a look at our matter ledger, we see we now have a balance of $25,000. And we have a cute little email icon, meaning that it's been emailed out. If I go to Mailinator, all right, it says, now this is just a throw. By the way, if you ever need a throwaway um, email address for whatever reason, you go to mailinator.com and you, you're cooking. So I have my 12 months paperless email address, your current invoice for blue versus orange. Um, if you take a look here on a normal email program, there will be an attachment. This one is, doesn't like allow for that kind of thing. But so I'm going to click here to pay using my credit card. So I'm going to click on this button. I'm the client. I got the invoice. I'm now going to pay. So I didn't have, on the law firm operational side of things, I didn't have to print everything out. I didn't have to fold it, stuff it, send it, stamp it, and spend the money on, on postage or whatever it is. Um, I just clicked the button, and basically this thing was emailed to my client. Now my client, I'm the client. I'm Lawrence Port. Okay, I owe $2,500. I am going to put in the Rocket Matter address here, and I'm going to use my bogus testing credit card number that I'm allowed to use and put in this thing and a bogus CVV. And I'm gonna click pay. So what this allows me to do is to pay online. So I've paid, now if we go back into Rocket Matter as the attorney, I can reload this page and I can see that the online payment has been recorded. So the payment has gone through, it's gonna hit my bank account next day uh, so I'll have money in the bank next day. I have record that there's been an online payment. I can see that the invoice has been looked at even before the payment. If the envelope is open, that means they've looked at it. 
and voila. So I've taken like a 30, 60, 90 day process and we've had people collect same day. Uh, more and more clients want to pay with points so with their credit cards. So it's been very popular. Um, so this is a huge time saver. So this is what we advocate in month six. Okay, month seven. Let me see if there's any question right now. Somebody says, I have, I use LawPay, but I have difficult difficulty getting clients to use it. I am thinking of canceling my subscription. It depends, uh, and this is from Joseph. Um, it really depends um, what clientele you're using. Obviously, it's a lot more popular with kind of like younger clientele. Um, a lot of businesses would prefer to pay, like smaller businesses would prefer to pay uh, with a business credit card. Um, you know, a lot of consumer oriented stuff would rather pay with a credit card. Um, so it really depends who you're using. And um, also, you know, there's, um, it's one thing we can talk about, but um, you can get better rates than law pay. Um, there's, you know, credit card processing is a whole other subject. Okay. Automate. Let's talk about this one now. Okay. We've, we've covered the bases. Let's, if you've gotten through month six and you're doing everything that we just laid out here and you, and you're able to accomplish that in six months time, you're doing amazing. Um, the things that we're going to discuss from here on out are icing on the cake. Okay. If you can do month seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, then that's amazing. You're ahead of, you're way ahead of where most firms are. So month seven, what I'm suggesting is automate simple documents with document assembly. So this allows you to click a button and create a document from fields in a database. And um, we do this in Rocket Matter. Hot Docs does that as well. So um, <clears throat> let me kind of show you how this works. Give you a sense. Um, the core idea is this. You Let's say that you're storing data in a database um, that says, okay, for a matter, you, you're recording your case number. You, you, you're keeping this data on hand anyhow, right? Because you want to be able to look your case information up. So whatever practice management system you're using, you're probably storing this information. Well, how great would it be if you didn't have to go and like find a document and do find and replace? What if you could just press a button and it would instantly create the document, right? So that's what we kind of have down here. You see that, I'll get my pen out for one quick second here, that we record the case number here, and then that corresponds to a place on the document here, right? And then we have the name of the court, which is the first court of Chuck Norris, which is a court you want to avoid. And you see that it goes into this spot right here, okay? So that's kind of the idea behind document automation. You store the data in a database, it, 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 it populates a document. And I can quickly show you how this works. So let's do this. Oh, I got to erase all my screen stuff. Look, it kept, it kept all there. Uh, isn't that funny? Let's try that one more time. All right, there we go. Now, let's, uh, I want to show you what a sample document looks like. So document templates, let's uh, take a look at this hearing notice. So I'm going to download this hearing notice, and I'm going to open it in Word so you can see it. Okay. All right. So you 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 have these uh, fields in here, right? So it says South Car state of South Carolina. Let's change this to state of Florida. And let's make it all caps. Um, so you see these funny little um, fields in here that have the double angle brackets around them. These are actually mail merge fields. Uh, Word is designed to be able to take like an Excel spreadsheet and stuff the values of the Excel spreadsheet into these kind of double angle bracket fields. And that's what their mail merge feature does. Um, so, but, but we're able to take advantage of those and we're able to stuff the data from the Rocket Matter database into this thing. So let me show you how this works. So we changed it to state of Florida and um, let's save this document. I'm gonna upload it. So I'm going to choose in downloads, hearing notice one, 
and I'm going to click next and I'm going to call this Florida hearing notice and I'm going to click next. So now I have uh, my document up here, right? And I'm going to go and I'm going to publish that. Now what I can do is I can take my Florida hearing notice and I can click merge to document and I'm going to click a matter that I have in my system. Now, what it does, if you take a look up here, I haven't filled out all the fields, so some, some of the stuff we haven't done, is that if we look on the lower right-hand side, it's gonna say, okay, I looked in this matter, and looks like there's some data here that needs to be cleaned up, but up here, the matter custom county, Blair County, so it's happening in Blair County, it's happening in PA32, so if you take a look, the Blair County thing got put over here in the document, and the case number got put here. I feel like Al Michaels and Chris Collinworth calling a football game when I draw on the screen. But that's the idea. And um, if I go next, I create this document and I'm able to store it in my system. So I'm gonna click next. Um, I'm gonna give it a title. I'm just gonna put title and I'm gonna publish it as a PDF. And then it stores it in my document folder inside of Rocket Matter. Okay, and we can hover over this thing and click on this and it's going to give you uh, an overview of the document that I just created. Okay, so that's how document automation works. Like I said, if you get to that point, you're doing amazingly well and uh, you don't have to be, there's a lot of people that can create those documents for you, those document templates. You can get like a high school guy, high school like intern to do it. We can do it for you. A lot of different people can help you out to get all, we, we had, we transitioned once an uh, Orlando based family law firm uh, and they wanted all of their uh, document templates uploaded into our system. So we did 240 documents for them. So there's ways to do that. Now uh, let's go back to the presentation for a second and we got some questions. Okay, so somebody says that there's uh, for, um, I'm not sure. So there's a competitor of ours, but I don't think it's for, um, it's for Mac only and I don't think it's for document assembly. It's called TimeNet Law. So I guess that's for a desktop base. If, if Phil, if you could provide any kind of like data about what their advantages or how it helps. Uh, let us know. Um, okay, month eight. I include month eight because I want people to realize that you don't have to do everything at once. You, so month eight is use downtime to scan your backlog. All right, um, when you go paperless, do not feel the need to scan everything at once. You don't have to do it. You can do it little by little. The most important thing is for you to have your active stuff scanned and paperless. And then you can go back through and scan the archive stuff. So uh, that's what month eight is about, right? And I think I, th this is based off of an article that I published that would have been in January and month eight would correspond to August, which would be kind of a slower month. And for law firms typically, and you can use your downtime to kind of go through all your stuff. So a good idea is to, mm, the, and the reason I put it here is because again, is that I just, I feel like law firms are overwhelmed with this subject of going paperless. And I really think it's important that they understand that it doesn't all have to happen at once and things can be done in a very systematic and gradual way. Okay. Let's see if I have concrete examples of this. Okay, good. Um, mobile paperless tools are awesome. So uh, I can't tell you how many times I've done a poor man scan by taking a picture of things. I'm sure other people on this call have done it, right? Um, so your, your smartphone has a camera, which is a very powerful thing. Now, um, I annotate is a very popular way to mark up PDFs, especially on uh, iPads. So I, it's hard for me to understand. I would actually, I would love for you to use your question widgets and let me know if you're using an iPad actively for like professionally, because way back when they came out, it seemed like a lot of attorneys were on board with the iPad and then they gave them mostly to their children to watch Netflix. 
So I would be very curious to find out if you are using your iPad professionally. Um, Scanner Pro, ScanBot, Scannable, all these things are, are, are little applications that you can put on your phone that allow you to take a picture and convert something into an actual document. Okay. Now, um, month 10, again, we're getting to real hardcore stuff here. Month 10 is to automate pleadings of more complex documents. When I talked about document assembly in month number seven, right? I said simple documents. So in month seven, you may want to do, for example, your engagement letters, basic hearing notices, so on and so forth. As time goes on, you may want to do more complex documents. You don't have to do them all at once. Remember, that's the key to this whole 12-month system. Month 10 is where you dig a little deeper. So don't do everything at once. Pick the top highest priority documents that you use more than others, right? And convert those because those are the ones where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck because it's going to be the ones that is going to reduce the most amount of time for you. And those mail merge fields that I showed you, um, they have if then else logic in them. Like you can do something like, for, for example, you can have a custom field in Rocket Matter that says gender. And based on what value is in gender, you can use different pronouns. You could use different salutations. So. Microsoft Mail actually is able to do a, a, the, the mail merge feature inside of Word itself, combined with a tool like Rocket Matter or other ones that work like ours. You can get very close, like I would say 80 to 90% of what a very powerful tool like Hot Docs would do. And you don't have to merge it with our stuff. You can use it, like I said, with Excel spreadsheets. Um, okay, we, this, we're revisiting kind of what we talked about before is that to realize it's still okay to use some paper. Not everything has to be electronic. Um, I still love paper for note taking. I know people are hooked on the Apple Pencil and the iPad and styluses and things like that. I'm hooked, I love pens, I love paper. This is my little pen thingy that I have at my desk. You know, I love taking notes. Um, there's something about the tactile feel of writing on paper that I just love. I still keep a paper journal and I, I like to write handwrite like notes. Um, so I really think that there's a time and place for paper. So I don't want people thinking that just because they're going paperless that they have to go all in. Now, obviously you don't have to spend a whole month doing this, but this is the point I'm trying to make. And then month 12, you celebrate. So we're done. So you can now, month 12, if you've done everything bit by bit here, you can view your documents from anywhere. You can work from home whenever you want or from your aunt's house on Thanksgiving. You have more time on your hands because you're not hunting around for files, right? Um, and if you, you can collect more money in a shorter amount of time and you have all these different ways where you can look for waste in your system, in your law firm, that is not providing value to your clients. So, you did it. The course number for this is 3330. And that is your Florida Bar CLE. Um, <clears throat> Did we skip month nine? Eight was used to downtime scan backlog and it seems like we hopped to month 10. Did we skip month nine? No, month nine was embracing the paperless tools. Okay, so we did not skip month nine. You had me nervous there. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> okay, Phil says, Phil's been awesome by the way. Phil has been more active on the questions in uh, chat widget than anyone else. Maybe Josia, Joseph, you guys chimed in a lot too. Up, oh, Ashley. Um, but uh, Phil does something that I do too. Uh, if you take paper notes, take pictures of them and put them in your paperless system. And I do that all the time. And I'll tell you what's a great tool for this that we didn't have time to get into is Evernote. Because what Evernote can do is it scans your handwriting. And if you haven't seen it before, it is pretty cool. So I don't do it so much anymore but I used to take pictures of our whiteboards. You know, we're a software company, we're always coming up with whiteboard ideas and take pictures of it. I'd send it into Evernote and then we could scan on the, the stuff that we would be doing. And when I do CLEs, live CLEs, a lot of times I like to show that I'll take a note, take a picture of it and that we can search for it like by the end of the CLE. It's really, really powerful. Um, <clears throat> so 
Oh, somebody said, are the notes saved as PDFs? They don't have to be saved as PDFs. They can be saved as images or or whatever you want. Uh, I'm trying to go back through. I know people asked questions early on. Somebody said, um, how do you man manage downloads to portable devices to control privacy? And how do you transfer files when an attorney leaves the firm? Um, those are very good questions. Uh, so privacy is a big deal, obviously. So look, I read some sort of crazy statistics that in a six month period, 20,000 like mobile phones are like left in taxis in Chicago's. So the reality is, is that people lose portable devices. Um, it, so the one thing that I have to stress is that every mobile device that you have has got to be locked with a password. You don't have to, there, there are certain options where you can destroy the information after somebody enters a wrong password 10 times in a row. I don't think you need to do that because it's really hard to get into a mobile phone or a laptop if you don't have the password. So the other thing is that you can you can have laptops have their uh, hard drives encrypted um, so that if somebody um, takes your laptop from you and pops out the hard drive and tries to put it somewhere else, they won't be able to access it anyhow. So I, I think those things are very important. In terms of transferring files when an attorney leaves the firm, if the attorney is taking the files with them, just make sure you do it over some sort of very secure way, um, you know, and a secure way, meaning ideally through some sort of encrypted connection. Let's see. Uh, two issues, safety and cloud storage, number one, and two, access if the net is down. Please discuss. Um, so suggestions for cloud storage, the, the, the providers that I recommended uh, Dropbox, Box, and all those other things, I recommend those. I, I have confidence that they are doing the right thing to keep your data safe. Um, I do not hesitate to recommend those to attorneys, and I understand the level of client confidentiality of what you do and that, that there can be patent lawyers out there or whistle people dis defending whistleblowers. I don't have a hesitation recommending those. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is like access to the internet. If access to the net if it's down like Florida bad weather you know it really depends where you live I mean I I don't know when the last time I have not had internet access to when I've absolutely needed it um, even on airplanes it seems like you can get online I mean one thing I will say is that my phone has a personal hotspot and if you don't have a phone that has a personal hotspot meaning you can't tether to it from your computer I would absolutely recommend it um, most things that you can access online, you can also access through a smartphone. So cloud is real. I mean, the, that's what mobile devices really are. There would be no mobile revolution, smartphone revolution without the cloud, because really what they are are cloud access points. So um, if you are storing things on the cloud, you should be able to get to it with a smartphone. Okay, let me see if any other questions rolled in. How do you balance slash mitigate a paperless office but for court hearings, you can't use or access effectively or efficiently to go completely. It can be a pressure point for support staff who see it as double work. Um, how do you, okay. So how do you balance when you wanna have a paperless office, but for court hearings, um, you can't go completely. I think, I think that whole thing, what you're talking about, if I understand your question correctly, Slade, is that you need to very carefully define your processes up front. You, you need to understand, and um, going back to my earlier slides, you, you just have to get buy-in from your staff as to how certain flows are gonna work. Not everything is gonna be as easy as other things, but usually you're gonna have like outbound stuff that you're creating and you're gonna have inbound stuff that's coming in. And I think as long as you, you isolate the different types of processes that you're gonna have with your paper stuff, then um, that's what's gonna be important to you. Um, what about the color version of the IX500 scanner? Well, the, uh, so, so this is a question by Norman. The, the IX500 Fujitsu ScanSnap scanner scans in color. There's, that's its default state, state. So you don't have to worry about black and white versus scanning. It's usually, usually when you scan, you have a certain amount of settings that it's a little goes beyond the scope of this, but you have certain settings that you can scan things in for. You can change the resolution size, meaning how 
how finely grained is the scan going to be. The, and the more fine you go, the, the larger the resolution, the larger the file size is going to be. And you can also dictate whether it's going to scan duplex, whether it's going to scan color, any of those things. Um, somebody said, I don't use Evernote, but use Notability. Have you used Notability and how does it compare to Evernote? I have not used Notability. I have used OneNote and OneNote is Microsoft's application. And I can see the draw of OneNote, especially if you're an iPad user. Uh, but personally, I like OneNote better than, um, I like Evernote better than OneNote. Okay, I think I've gone through all of the questions. I wanna thank you all so much for uh, joining me today. You are gonna get a copy of the slides. You're gonna get a copy of the video. Um, and in addition, uh, if you have any questions at all, it's Larry at rocketmatter.com. I'm always happy to answer a question, uh, whether it's related to any of this stuff or not. So drop me a line and uh, take a look, by the way, at the 10 Minute Law Firm podcast and the Lean Law Firm podcast, which are two things that I've been hosting lately. Those are a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.